patiently waiting for us. Okay. Hi, Thomas. Hello, all. Um, I, I think we will wait a few more moments here mm -hmm. to um, let people, uh, if they're not paying attention to the time, they can um, shift mm -hmm. from posters over to this session. So, so we will wait a, a few moments um, before we get started with the uh, follow-up Q and A session mm -hmm. um, from this morning's keynote. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll put this screen up so that if people want to start reading. Um, we can read some of the questions. Um, okay. So, oh, sorry. Let me go a little bit. Um, I just took it away. Why, why did I take it away? Hmm, sorry. <laughs> I just. <laughs> um, sometimes you click the wrong thing. Okay, I'll okay. unfocus that screen while you find it and then. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let me take it away. Oh, come on. Let me take this away and then. Yeah. My God, too many screws open. Uh, open up this one. And this one. And what's it? Here, come on, where is it? Maybe it's here. Oh no. Where is it? Just click this one. Hmm. Oh, where is it? Oh. Come on. That's strange. How can it just go away? Mm -hmm. Not this one. Um, it's hidden there somewhere. Come on. Um, let me open that again. Mm -hmm. I see it in the foot. But, oh, hmm. Interesting. Oh, cool. Maybe I can say save and then open it again. I don't want to destroy it because I did not save it. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, there is a. Oh, here, 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 here. Here, 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 here's a, here's a, okay, oh, here. Here, here, here. Oh, okay. It's under. under oh, 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 save. Yes, please. Oh, so, so cancel and then pull it. My goodness. There is a video yeah. record of uh... <laughs> Let me save also. Why is it? Why is it? Oh, here is killing it for today. And I also save it. Save. Why well, too many things open? It's not a good idea. But not in which I save. Well, you're doing that. I'm just going to give uh, a, a little bit of intro mm -hmm. for, for people joining us here. Mm -hmm. I'll just say that um, okay. we have moved the, the questions forward that, that weren't answered in, in the first session. Mm -hmm. However, I don't see that the people who asked those questions are now flagged. And, and so um, if, if you'd like to identify if you have a question uh, from before, uh, because I'd like to invite people on screen. Uh, but as I say, uh, we don't actually have the identities of, of the people who asked the questions from this morning, uh, and they might also not be here. So so if you did ask a question from this morning, uh, please write in the chat um, which what the nature of your question. And then um, that is if you'd like to uh, to um, you know ask it or, or have any sort of uh, back and forth uh, dialogue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm Tom. I can't actually see the the names. Normally, you can, and for any newly asked questions, I can see the name of the the question asker. But of the ones that were shifted forward uh, from the morning session, um, the the question asker is actually not. You can mm -hmm. then look them up 
in the people list. Um, mm. Yeah, no, there, there's actually I, I I I know where the invite user on screen and and mm -hmm. the name there is part of the question. No, mm. it is as if OCNS is the question. Oh, if you ask the question. In, in all of the cases, question. so so. Um, Interesting. You're referring to under the start answering box. Oh, there is one for instance. Okay. There's well, a name. Uh, so so you can't see what I'm. I'm I, I I think what oh, I'm see, looking at here. Where it, it says that uh -huh. OCNS. Um, uh -huh. Okay. Second question, mm -hmm. Peter Mazalik at the end of the text. Okay, well, uh, okay, okay, I see it now. And then, okay, so yes, um, and and I will try to find those names. Uh, okay, and I see some some texts of people that that aren't able to come on. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, I think what we'll do here is Anand uh, Pathak available to ask the question? Uh, if not, then what I'm gonna do is is, is just ask it. Uh, if I don't see you mm -hmm. pop up in chat um, and uh, and then we can go. So if, if you do want to, to ask or ask a follow-up question, then please uh, go ahead. So now we're gonna get uh, started here. I'll ask the first question with the highest number of votes. Uh, I think these are votes maybe from, from just now, but um, the question is, is the salience in the fused image case uh, mm -hmm. possibly due to the minute jittery relative motion between the two eyes such that the bar on the right screen would appear to be slightly vibrating with respect to other bars? Uh, that's a very good question. It's not the case because we also did a control experiment asking people to actually tell us uh, is which bar is in the other eye. And they cannot tell. So obviously they cannot see it. And they don't even have to tell us which bar. Sometimes there is no bar. So we just ask them, is there a bar at all in a different eye? Even that they cannot tell. So the jittering obviously is not enough to make them identify uh, which uh, the unique bar. Yeah, I think this is referring to, um, let, me, let me go to that. Um, so we do we do have the question asker with us here. Uh -huh. um, if I don't know if that answers your question, or if you want to clarify any points or add something to it. Yeah. So what I was asking was that uh, uh, in that uh, particular experiment where uh, the two boxes were there and the image was fused, and uh, am I audible? Your your audio is not very good. Um, oh, I'm so sorry about that. Okay. Actually, I'm logged in as a moderator also, so it's uh, I'm uh, right now on the cell phone. Okay. I think this might uh, might might not work okay. too well. Um, but you can, okay. for instance, if you want to add any details to the chat, I can relay relay them, or or I think sure. our, our speaker can also see the chat. Are you able, Xiaoping? Are you able to see the the chat? as well so uh, okay. i think the audio maybe it's not gonna it's not gonna happen <laughs> sorry about that and then okay. so I'm gonna but the, i can i more or less oh sorry my point point powerpoint is uh, is, is not responding no okay, wonder it's uh, but i understand the the question why is it echo can you hear echo i think it's okay now Oh, it's okay. Okay, so let me reopen this PowerPoint. Okay, and so you are worried that. The, oh, now we have the echo again. <laughs> yeah, what is the echo? Let me take off. Oh, can you remove that? We're not hearing you now. I think you might have to.
Can you try toggling your mic? I see that it's it's turned off at the top, at the top of your screen. If you mouse over, I'm trying to do it, but I can't. Oh, okay. We're getting a reconnection here. Is there, it better? Yes. yes. And we can is hear you. Is it still echo? There is a little bit of echo, but I think it's, it may correct itself. So how about let me take this off and re retoggle? Okay, now we can't hear you. Okay, and and I, I got that. I'll okay. Can't I can't hear you? Um, although you don't seem to be muted right now. Is it on your microphone? No, we don't hear you right now. Can't can't hear you. Okay, I, I see that your your mic is toggled to mute right now. Can you turn that the mute off? Hopefully, then it will work. Can you hear me now? Better? Yes. 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 Okay. I think there might be a, a concern. Do you have a second device with like a second window open? Because I think if um, oh. may, maybe you're. Oh, yes. I do have a second one. Sorry. Sorry. So, so maybe at least you can turn, maybe yeah. mute to that second one. Um, yeah. Well, I guess you're yes, not invited just, on screen with that. So um, I okay. just turned off the second one. Is it? Okay. I, I think the audio is good now. Everyone, okay, I think, good. I think so. Okay. okay. So, so Anand ha, ha, in the chat, he wrote a, a follow-up question that we couldn't get with the audio. So, I wanted to know mm -hmm. whether the saliency in the vertical bar in the right box is due to inherent neural architecture or due to subtle vibration between both images. Oh, I see. Is this when uh, one image is in the left eye and another image in the right eye? Yeah. If that's the case. Um, that it's not due to sudden vibration because we uh, ask observer to tell us if they can tell whether there is a bar in a different eye and the observers cannot do that task. That means there isn't enough vibration for them to even tell whether there is a bar in a different eye. So this is actually gaze shift to this unique bar in a unique eye without the observer even be able to tell whether it's such a unique. So it's completely dissociation between the awareness and uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, gaze shift. So it's, it's not uh, because okay. there is a movement, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good, okay. So we're gonna try to move on to uh, uh -huh. another question here. Uh, and there is one uh, from Peter uh, Mazalik. Uh, is is mm -hmm. Peter available to ask the question? If so, please comment and I'll invite you on screen. Okay, I'm gonna start asking the, the question and then uh, Peter can join us if he's around. So as a follow-up to the question about the bottleneck and the amount of information we can receive, isn't it mm -hmm. one of the insights of information theory that visual data around us is really redundant? Therefore, it could be compressed by getting rid of redundancy and using an encoding that maximizes entropy of the distribution. Yes, and so first of all, let's say how much redundancy, how much can you uh, compress? So we have 20 images per second coming at one megabytes per image. So it's 20 megabytes per second of it of data coming in, that's raw data, not compressed. Okay, so how much can you compress? The JPEG and MPEG is very good at compression. They can compress by a factor of 100. So therefore you can compress from 20 megabytes to 
one megabyte, let's say, this is all of magnitude. And one megabyte is still too much. Okay, so um, one megabyte is a huge book of war and peace is what you can put in one megabyte. So you cannot read in one second. And so if you can indeed compress them, all of them, then you will not have attentional blindness. The fact that experiment data tell you, you we, we do not see a gorilla in our midst. We do not see things like that. That means our blindness is not trivial. Our blindness is huge. And so therefore it's not possible for us to uh, uh, have such, um, yeah, uh, uh, the compression is not enough. You have to delete. And then you can say, why is it that we never fail? You know, if, if the, the data is one megabytes per second and we can only read uh, uh, here 40 megabytes, less than 1%, how come we do not feel that we are blind? We are essentially blind because 99% of the information is thrown away. And uh, this sounds a philosophical question, but let me give you an analogy. Imagine you were born blind. You never had eyes. Would you know that you're blind? You wouldn't. Until your neighbor tells you that you are blind, you don't have eyes. Then you cannot even comprehend what your neighbor means. Okay. So we do not have such neighbor to tell us that we are blind. We are born so blind, all of us. And so it's, that's why it's only 1999 is the first time we realized this inattentional blindness in a heavy manner. Of course, previously, people kind of noticed it before, but it didn't make it such a big thing. And so it was coming as a surprise because we were born that way. Yeah. And only the experimental data tell us, oh, we did not even see gorillas in our midst. This is our neighbor. Our neighbor finally told us that we appreciate we're blind. And so this is just making me at least I very much appreciate how intelligent our brain is, despite only having 40 bits per second out of one megabytes per second, we can still survive and not being eaten by the tiger jumping at us, or by the car hitting us. That means we chose the right 40 bits out of one megabyte to pay our attention to, so we save our lives. That's amazing. And therefore, choosing which two sentences out of this book to pay attention to is even perhaps, you know, in my opinion, more important than actually recognize was it a tiger jumping, jumping at me or was it a cat jumping at me? Yeah, well, cat, I wouldn't run away. Tiger, I will run away. Yeah, so. Great, okay, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. There was a highly ranked question from this morning, so I'm gonna jump down. The, the question mm -hmm. was from Shivangi. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're available, please um, mention this on, on chat. But I'm going to ask the question in the meantime. Uh, but, mm -hmm. but if you uh, mention something mm -hmm. on chat, I'll invite you on screen as well. So the question mm -hmm. was, what is the formation of the salience map based on? Mm -hmm. So for formation of the salience map, uh, I'm not sure I understand, but salience map is form form formation in, in V1. It's based on the firing rate of V1 neurons. I'm not sure whether I understand the question enough to actually answer, is this the right answer or not? Yeah. First of all, the salience map is equal to the V1 firing neuron is a hypothesis. And this hypothesis uh, then says, okay, how does it do it? Because a computational idea is there's a saliency map in V1. And then what's the algorithm? Uh, V1 takes the feed forward residue field, which is the uh, Hebrew neurons. Then uh, it does this surround suppression using the algorithm. Uh, surround suppression is the algorithm, and using the implementation details, recurrent connections in V1 to make e firing rate of V1 neurons dependent not only on the visual input within its residue field, but also input beyond in a surround, such that the visual response, V1 neural response depends on the context. So therefore, a, a vertical bar is salient in the context of horizontal bars, but not salient in the context of other vertical bars. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. I think so. We don't have the question asker um, here, mm -hmm. but but hopefully that was was going mm -hmm. to answer. Um, so there was a follow up question to the previous mm -hmm. question um, mm -hmm. that, that came up in chat. So I have the the question asker here with us. So so please go ahead. Great. Yeah. Please. Hopefully okay. the audio is going to work. Mm -hmm. I hope so as well. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Thank you so much for answering the questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I keep being holed up by the, the 40 bits per second. 
Mm -hmm. um, so I understand it is a measurement from the 50s. Yeah. How was this established? Was this um, black box measurement or did they put probes into the connections between the V1 and the V2? No, it's going from the connections. So, so if you want to measure an information channel, information yeah. channel, there's always an input to the channel, then output to the channel. Yes. So here the channel is a human person. The okay. input is the image to our eyes. The output yeah. is our report. Our Perfect. human person thank, thank is the channel. Yeah. yeah. I can answer so, my follow-up question. Then I can yeah. answer my follow-up. So you measured 40 bits per second on these interfaces. That's but right. in your model, you say that there is only 40 bits per second going from the V1 to the V2. No, no. I said, if you put vision as encoding, selection, and decoding, and so then the selection will eventually go towards 40 bits. But I say it starts at V1. So it's possible that before, you know, so we, we, we realize it's 20 bits, uh, 20 megabytes at the retina. And yeah. then it's compressed outside the, at the end of the, um, beyond the retina optic nerve, it's one megabyte. Okay. And one megabyte entering V1. And I yeah. say, okay, oh, start the output of V1, it should start to go down because by then you already select to direct your gaze. But it goes uh, down. It no, could be only going How do you it, it know not... that there is a reduction over there? Because you're measuring at the eye. You say that you measured encoding on the mouth and on the eye. How okay. do you know that there is a reduction in information between the V1 and the V2? Okay. First of all, it's a theoretical hypothesis, then it's data. Okay. So theoretical hypothesis is that since V1 is already guiding your gaze, it's already doing the selection. Computationally, we are on computational neuroscience conference. You say, if it's already selecting, once it's selected, there's no point keep on uh, the, the non-selected information forward unless you are, are full of energy you know you don't mind wasting your brain resources so it's a first of all logical argument secondly you're right even if you you argue that way maybe your argument is wrong you know maybe it still keep feeding all the information but so let's see how much from v1 to v2 is start to go down does it go all the way directed from one megabyte to 40 bits or perhaps it only go from one megabyte to half a megabyte or, or perhaps only from one megabit. Uh, uh, maybe go to it could 20 go to 100 even. megabits. Oh, you mean you expand? Have... Information cannot expand. Information can only oh, go yeah. down. Okay, yeah. So therefore, it cannot go from one megabyte to more than one megabyte. Okay, at the maximum, it keep being one megabyte. But let's see. There's already something dropping. What information is missing in V two that's not in V one? Uh, uh, what information is in V one not in uh, is already missing in V two? Do you know? Are there direct projections from the LGN to V2? Maybe, yes, but uh, if even those then, are there, there is no missing so information. There is, there, no, uh, actually, from today's talk, I give you a quiz. What information is missing at V2 that's not in V1? Um, boop, boop. The one with the boxes that shifts over there that is dependent on the 2i uh, information. Exactly. By V2, you already miss the eye of origin information. Hmm? In your experiment? Yeah, in the experiment, but it's also in the data. Uh, Hubert Weasel, ever since in 1960s, they found V2 neurons are mostly binocular. And V1 neurons... It uh, monocular Which, uh, I think and binocular. I should... So therefore, by V2, if you take V2's neuron firing, you cannot decode what's the eye of origin. And so therefore, it's not just a human reporting. They cannot tell you whether this is coming from left eye or right eye. It's already missing. Okay, there's other information also missing. What's the other information? The complex cells of V1 are missing information because their firing is invariant to exact phase relationships. So if the simple cells do not feed all information to V2, mostly complex cell territory the task, then you are also missing a lot of spatial details. So it's actually an empirical question. I like to motivate this experimental uh, 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 investigation to actually quantify how much information is missing in V2 so that we can appreciate. So that's why I left it as a margin. I say, is it really all the way to 40 bits? I doubt it. But is it? 0 0.9 megabytes? I doubt it too. I wonder maybe, you know, go from one megabyte to 
hmm, order of magnitude half a megabyte. But even if it's half a megabyte, it's already a disaster for an electrophysiologist. Why? Imagine I'm measuring a V2 through the field. You stick the electrode into a V2 neuron, and visual information needs to cut, present it on the screen. You measure the neurons firing, and the information is coming in. But what if this information does not reach this neuron? And reaches on this trial, not that trial. Why? Because sometimes it's, it's going to the bottleneck, sometimes it's not going to the bottleneck. It's not repeatable. This is why electrophysiologists always say V2 and extra strike cortical wrist fields are more difficult to measure. Well, human okay. weasels are lucky. They have it all. Whether it's the animals anesthetized or not, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And so in this sense, we have lots of these hints are uh, indicating to us that from V1 to V2, information is starting to go down a leaking pipeline. And I, uh, I would like to use this framework to, to, to motivate experiment to actually quantify how much leaking is leaking. Yeah. So I think Jim had um, a sort of related Hi, Jim. question. <laughs> I think you guys know each other. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to kick you off. Jim is my teacher at Caltech. I learned lots of yeah, thank you. Nice to see you, Jim. Nice to see you too. Yes, I was going to ask what it's like after many years to actually be doing experimental neuroscience. But <clears throat> I have a question oh about this subject. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so a tremendous amount of work in the visual system has kind of assumed that we get information, it goes in, uh -huh. it goes in, it goes in, it goes in. Your uh -huh. work and other work suggests that actually we know a lot about, or we assume uh -huh. a lot about uh -huh. the world just in how mm -hmm. we point our eyes, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that implies that there's actually an internal model that we're working with as we mm -hmm. seek information, right? Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. explains why some people see the world that I don't see, mm -hmm. okay? Like prominent <laughs> people in the United States. But anyway, so my question is this, from the point of view of information, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, if what happens in the information sense, Mm -hmm. If you have a sophisticated internal model mm -hmm. of the world, which mm -hmm. is what you're using to organize your, your seeking of information, mm -hmm. okay, then what happens in an information sense going from V1 to V2 if what you're now doing, for example, is uh, interacting with and doing something which is in relation to this internal model? Mm -hmm. So, so the idea of, you know, sort of leaking information that the further you go in, you have lower and lower amounts of information. Mm -hmm. It could be in a larger sense, sort of, sort mm -hmm. of a cognitive sense, isn't it possible that that information from the outside going in when combined with the information that's already there, mm -hmm. in effect, produces a larger, deeper uh amount of information or context for behavior? Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, you cannot create more information, but inside your brain, what you have is actually a code book. Okay, so you have a code entering, and then you need a code book to, to kind of look up. So when I say you have a feedback in the central visual field, is that using this code book to say, hey, are these two dots really vertically lined up or horizontally lined up? This code has the knowledge that this neuron is tuned, you know, it's like a label line, this neuron is tuned to horizontal. And so therefore, if this neuron is firing, it must be because something, this and that. And so it has this code book and say, now, because this neuron tell me this and other neuron not tell me, so therefore I wonder what are possible sets of input. And this, the internal knowledge knows that this neuron already restricts to me. It's not Jim Bauer in the input. It must be Steve Prescott, you know what I mean? So this is because the code book it has. And so therefore, it can top down feedback and say, I don't need to look for American. I just look for a Canadian, you know? So, so it, so when the input is ambiguous, it's like an ambiguous perception. You have this, uh, mega cube perception. It can only be this way or another way. So, it will only top down query only A or B. It's not gonna query C or D or E or F because by the internal model, it knows it's not possible C, D. It's only possible A and B. However, whether it's A or B, internally you cannot create. It only says it's only possible A and B. Then I need to go back to V1 and still externally to query, is it really A or B? So this is what I mean. 
uh, it doesn't create information it clarify by querying for more information yeah and it's this is why time. if you if you have a visual input and suddenly mask it okay you present the input so short that you mask the backward masking can create problems because when it's going back to query you give us some other input then this is so we predict that this backward masking is more severe in a problematic in central visual field because the the, the feedback is in central visual field so a lot so of these framework can, can yeah, yeah i understand it knows how to interpret the code based mm -hmm. on what the neurons do and don't do Mm -hmm. My question is, and it's a hard thing to get at, in the olfactory mm -hmm. system, we think that I suspect that the olfactory cortex has a map of the metabolic world mm -hmm. has accumulated over evolutionary time. So when mm -hmm. the olfactory system is actually, uh, to go back to a, to a subject that you used to think about. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. When the olfactory system is actually doing a recognition, it's mm -hmm. getting information, but it's re mm -hmm. it, that's referenced to this deep knowledge that it has about the olfactory world. And yes. so really understanding how it works, you need to understand something about the reference frame that's provided by this deep historical evolutionary model. And I know yeah. people in vision know, mm -hmm. you know, play around with that, right? We know that mm -hmm. bright things are usually up and dark things are usually down. Mm -hmm. I think it's 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 a hard problem, but it's an interesting problem to ask, which sort of close the loop that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, how sophisticated and how much knowledge does the brain actually have? Okay. Yeah. That it is uh, it using as a reference mm -hmm. for the data that's coming in. So but. this is very interesting. In, in fact, my work on vision is a lot inspired by my olfactory work, which was I did in the Caltech as my PhD thesis. You were there as well. I, I was working with John Hotfield. And so one of these things is indeed olfactory cortex feedback to the olfactory bulb. It causes, uh, this is the hypothesis of the thesis, that this top-down feedback actually cancel out the background to do the foreground um, recognition and this is in fact trying to meet expectation you know explain away the background get the foreground and it can cause problems just like back what masking what happens is if you I smell my dog in my kitchen yeah very good then on top of that you have the coffee and uh, then you can subtract the background dog and you get a foreground coffee but what if when I'm presented a coffee at the same time with the same sniff, take away the dog you just get subtracted from? Now I will sniff coffee will smell different because I thought the dog was still there. This is called cross adaptation because you just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fool the system. Yes, this top down feedback, you know, whether it's an olfactory system, it's a backward masking, metric contrast masking, they are all kind of connected. And this is in a computational terms called analysis by synthesis and it has to be respectful with with certain rules and, and these rules if you violate you get these strange illusions or problems they can become diagnostic for the underlying computational algorithm yeah very so everyone should learn about the olfactory system before they go anywhere close to vision <laughs> otherwise mm -hmm. you're lost Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We do have a, a quick follow-up question that maybe you could address mm -hmm. quickly before we mm -hmm. move on to the next question. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. that was uh, from the previous question asker. Can an input mm -hmm. result in memories being recalled, adding to the information content of an experience? I think you partly answered that, but do you want to address mm -hmm. that, that question uh, directly? Can an input result in memory being recalled? Uh, adding the information content of experience. Actually, I do not completely understand the question very well. Um, uh, in a sense that um, maybe I'll use the olfactory uh, example. Okay, so uh, my colleague at, 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 uh, earlier in UCL, in fact, uh, I, I was discussing with him on the uh, actually Jay Goodnot. Yeah. Um, so they have this experiment where they ask the subject, is there something smell there? Okay, they give the sniff some smell and it's so weak the subject not, cannot tell very well. And then at the same time, if you show them an image, let's say you show them an image of an orange, then they are more likely, in, imagine if they are smelling, mm. sniffing orange, they are more likely to say yes in the orange. But then it's a false alarm, right? And no false alarm. 
okay? False alarm rate does not go up. So therefore, having the visual image of an orange make you imagine that could be an orange. You know, this obviously is internal knowledge. Uh, and then that, 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 I don't know whether this indirectly asked your question, but if you can right. please maybe make a more specific phrasing of your question okay. so I can answer more directly. Okay, mm -hmm. so I, I think at this point we will maybe mm -hmm. move on. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, Jim has got a, a comment there. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think we'll move on uh, to another question here because uh, mm -hmm. Shavika has been very patient. I'm going to invite them on mm -hmm. screen now to ask mm -hmm. uh, a question that was posed in the, the, the question box before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shavika, I've invited you. Oh, accepted and connecting. Okay, so be on here mm -hmm. in a few moments. Mm -hmm. Just wait for it. <laughs> Maybe I can have a preview. I'll, of this I'll ask question. the question while she okay. while they're they're coming online. If there is an mm -hmm. image in which one bar has different orientation than others, and there is another bar which is continuously moving, how does the V one decide which one to focus attention on first? Uh, and oh, we have I see. The question asker with us now. Um, I don't okay. know if you want to add anything to the the question. Um, oh, I see. So how to... does the V one decide? Yeah. How does V one decide? Yeah. Nope. Just wait. We're not. We're not. Your audio is a little bit um, jumpy. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. So, so try now. The V1 V1 does not V1 decides by the firing rate. So if the firing rate to a uniquely oriented bar is higher than the firing rate to the uniquely moving bar, then this is the hypothesis that higher the firing rate the higher the saliency. And this is hypothesis is, is um, confirmed in our monkey experiment with my colleague Wu Li and uh, Yang Ying. They, they show that the higher the firing of V1 neuron, the faster the eyes are cut to it. Yeah, so that's the hypothesis and this hypothesis is, is uh, having its prediction confirmed in the behaving monkey in the experiment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that answer so, your question? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to add on a bit. Uh, so from the slides where you showed uh, the bars of different orientations, in mm -hmm. which you have uh, uh, bars of the same orientation and bar of one bar of different orientation in between. So mm -hmm. there, uh, the, uh, the attention, uh, the, selective, the selectivity of V1 depends on the how firing rate of the uh, corresponding neurons so as mm -hmm. you already said that the like neurons will suppress each other mm -hmm. and uh, there is one neuron corresponding to the bar of different orientation which will whose firing rate will be the highest but mm -hmm. for the case when we have uh, say suppose we have an image in which we have uh, one bar of different orientation and there is another bar which is moving and mm -hmm. the rest all uh, the other bars have the same orientation then Mm -hmm. How does the V1 decide that which one is the uh, the bar in which it has to focus attention on? Or mm -hmm. I thought I already answered that question, so I answer it again. V1 decides by the firing rate. So if the firing rate to one bar is higher than the firing rate down to the other bar, then it, it, that the firing rate with the higher firing rate is the more salient. Of course, this decision is made by a recurrent circuit in V1 where they have this like-to-like -like suppression. And then you can okay, okay. say, how does the know the like-to-like -like suppression between orientation stronger or between uh, 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 that stronger? And so through experience, maybe through the evolution as well as through this uh, uh, individual animals growing up experience, it has already built up this plasticity this such that and make it uh, this way. Of course, there's also individual differences. Maybe your V1 is slightly different from mine, such that maybe you will weigh up the orientation slightly more than me or slightly, but qualitatively, it looks like many people are very similar, even though your V1, there's up to a size of two difference between one human's V1 and another human's V1. And some 
people, for instance, they also have a strong color sensation. Some color is stronger to some people than others. So there is quite individual difference. And in my lab, in our experimental data, we find these difference. Yeah. But nevertheless, uh, you know, uh, uh, in principle, yeah, you, you can have um, uh, uh, the V1 decides by the firing rate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a couple of questions and askers that aren't available. So I'm going to ask one of the, the questions. Uh, and mm -hmm. if Grace is here, um, please mm -hmm. uh, send a chat. Um, is their original paper on, okay, sorry, in their mm -hmm. original paper on saliency maps in the brain, Kafka and Ullman, mm -hmm. 1985, suggests LGN as where mm -hmm. the selection first occurs, but you say V1. Why do you think LGN doesn't have this selection? Oh, very good question. Yeah. And so, First of all, if you are selecting it, then it's better that um, you will have your saliency map be read by somebody, read it, and execute an eye movement shift. <coughs> LGN does not project to the superior curriculus, which will read the saliency map and do the gaze shift. So it can't be the LGN. That's uh, the main answer. I can give you secondary reasons, but this will be uh, maybe. Oh, hopefully that will satisfy uh, Unless you. somebody asks for more reasons, yeah. Okay. But that's the main reason. No, I think that that's, um, mm -hmm. that, that's fine. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to read mm -hmm. another question here, and then I'll try mm -hmm. to find some other question askers. Um, mm -hmm. Is the speed and accuracy of the selection process the same for all tested specimens? I'm not sure no. exactly what specimen 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 maybe species, species. <laughs> yes species, no. yeah. yeah speed and accuracy uh, trade off is not even the same within a single animal because uh, we will do the trade off sometimes it's more important for us to react quickly but not accurately sometimes it will be more accurate and be slow depending on the context so even individual animals will change that trade off so not to mention between animals, yeah. Right, and I think you also referred to the central versus peripheral differences between species yeah. earlier and whatnot. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, mm -hmm. Well, okay, we'll do that one. Okay, so there's a, a question from Alex. I'm going to read it out. Recent work mm -hmm. has highlighted the role of disinhibitory V1 cortical VIP neurons in poking mm -hmm. holes in the blanket of inhibition. That's in quotes. That, that is inhibition of inhibitory interneurons, which could mm -hmm. contribute to generating a spotlight of attention. Given what mm -hmm. is known about decoding of visual information across visual cortical areas, is it likely that there are similar or very different local neural mechanisms processing information across different areas? Yes. So, for instance, in, in my proposed framework, you have encoding, selection, and decoding. So if V1 is doing the selection, let's say V1 is not doing decoding at all. In fact, I think V1 is doing decoding, as I say, this before feedback. So some other area is doing decoding and not doing saliency. So it must be different. And the, 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 the data so far shows that at least bottom-up saliency is almost exclusively in V1. Of course, we can find more data to say maybe it's not exactly exclusively, but V1 is dominantly computing uh, bottom-up saliency, then these other visual areas uh, cannot be doing that so much, then by if that's the case, they cannot be the same. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just looking here to see if uh, uh, Walter would like to ask his next question. I will start it, and then he can join us on stage if there's any follow-up. So the V1SH mm -hmm. saliency or saliency hypothesis mentions a firing rate as determining factor. Mm -hmm. I think this came up in an earlier answer. To assess a rate of neuron we need to integrate over time, could the saliency be encoded into a sparse parallel coding? This might be faster and match better with the most reflex-like behavior of eye games. Oh, I see. Very good question. Yes. So uh, even though firing rate is a, is, a, is a determining factor, but in fact, equivalent is just the first spike latency. Okay, so one very inaccurate way, but it's very quick way, this is another speed accuracy trade-off, is just say, first spike coming from whom? First spike coming from a neuron in the upper visual field, this location, then that's more salient. Okay, then the latency to the first spike is the quickest way. 
triggered and by course, yeah. or something like that? I mean, what's the reference to that latency? Uh, so let's say there is a, uh, because it can be from the last saccard. So let's say that from the last saccard, you fix it on something and then you investigate and decode and say, hey, it's a face, you know, somebody. And then you 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 want to go to the next one. It could be counted from the last saccadic landing or counted from somehow you, you're you done with this task, you're ready to go. Uh, this, this uh, I think you can formulate a different way if you like. But in principle, yes, you're right. The longer you can wait to count the more spikes, the maybe better accurate. But sometimes you don't need to be accurate. You just want to act fast. So if a tiger is jumping at you, you don't want to say, is this a male tiger or female tiger? Who cares? Just run. Yeah, don't, you don't have to count how many teeth this tiger has. <laughs> just go. Right. Yeah. So you don't have to wait for the second spike. Just, just run. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, we're, we're, coming close to the end of the questions. And I think Ben had suggested mm -hmm. that his internet connection uh, would preclude mm -hmm. him from coming on. So I'm gonna ask the question, how does mm -hmm. the new framework compare to predictive coding slash processing framework that proposes the predicted stimuli are suppressed from further processing and only unpredicted stimuli registers get or get attended to? Predict the coding, okay. Uh, I have a framework which talk about encoding and selection and decoding. In encoding, usually people talk about Shannon information encoding. That means you just talk about information bits and you don't talk about content. In that, you already have predictive coding. Predictive coding this framework has been around since 19, uh, uh, you know, even information theory days, yeah? And so do you mean that predictive coding? Yeah. And on the selection bit, in the selection bit, there is top-down selection and bottom-up selection. A lot of the top-down selection is predicted selection. So I will, you know, for instance, look towards the doorway because I predict my dog will walk in that way. Yeah. And so I will, you know, in anticipation, your anticipation is a car is prediction. On the other hand, because my dog is walking that way, I want, I don't want to look and go. And so there's lots of prediction. Do you mean that? Or the predicted coding in, uh, is not only in selection, could be in decoding. In, in decoding, uh, uh, you know, then, then when I say you want to feedback and query to say whether input is A or B, a lot of it is your internal knowledge. What do you mean? And uh, uh, I can better answer your question if you can more precisely put it, because otherwise it's very difficult. You can say um, it's too general. You can say it's saliency map out of the evolution. And then, yeah, sure. And that's a too general question. Yeah, so I don't know if Ben is available mm -hmm. to, to pose mm -hmm. a follow up here. Um, but mm -hmm. isn't that that predicted, so so maybe part part of the, the specific mm -hmm. detail here is, is our predicted mm -hmm. stimuli suppressed? I mean, so are they almost like, so you're selecting the most, the, the unpredicted. Um, mm -hmm. So let's say in the encoding. Is, is okay, part in of that, that, yeah. Is selection part mm -hmm. of this predictive coding and in a, in a, is the prior somehow represented in what is selected? I mean, maybe that's mm -hmm. part of the question. Oh, okay. So let's focus on the selection bit then. So things that pop out, for instance, vertical bar out of horizontal bar that pop out is the most unpredicted part. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you look at the context, everything is horizontal. And then you just cover the, 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 the vertical. Then you ask people, what's behind my thumb? I just cover that vertical. Right? People guess it's a horizontal vertical. You will guess predicted horizontal. And you raise the accrued and say, oh, wow, vertical. That is the most unpredicted part. And that used to be, that, that can be the most salient. So sometimes people equate saliency as surprise. You did not predict. It's just so that the surprise works 100%, not 100% 100 of the time. Sometimes things unpredicted it's not salient. And so therefore, surprise is not 100% correct measurement of saliency. Operation measures saliency, how strong is attractiveness. But anyway, uh, you know, just for prediction, saliency is the most unpredicted part. But top-down selection, sometimes you will use your prediction. Yeah. And so predicted coding, do you mean encoding or decoding? Okay, yeah. selection is yeah, not coding. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, and, and Ben is not here to ask a follow up there. So, mm -hmm. okay. Um, we do have uh, two questions left, and I think we're going to leave mm -hmm. 
uh, here, I'm going to invite Thomas on um, oh. because we'll leave Hi, Jim's, Jim's very general question as perhaps a last one to end uh, mm -hmm. the session. So Thomas should be uh, joining us. And his question, and I'll, I'll just read it off and then, oh, okay, no, he's here. Go ahead, Thomas. Oh, hi, Thomas. Hi, Thomas. Yeah, it's a bit irritating, this little delay, isn't it? Uh -huh. um, I just was wondering, it seemed to me that your optical illusions depend a lot on the shape of the receptive fields of the early neurons in the system. Mm -hmm. So that they are bore like with a plus and a minus, right? Mm -hmm. um, is it just inevitable that receptive fields look like that, or is the visual illusion just very specific to how the human system works? Hmm, I wonder. But because in cats, they also have these uh, receptive fields. Um, you know, of course, we, we know in V1 we have bar detectors and edge detectors. In the morning, I kind of used the edge detector, it worked. So I suspect if you have an animal that only has bar detector, maybe it would not work. So that would be something interesting. Can we find such an animal? And then see this illusion doesn't <laughs> work on it. Yeah, yeah. It and uh, um, to, to the vulnerability of uh, feed forward uh, artificial neural networks, so there, of course, you can manipulate what kind of filters they have. Uh, so that's so right, you, that's you, right, yeah. 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 Uh -huh. in, in this artificial neural network, you know, they, you can present a panda and then you change a little bit of the texture. It was, it's a given. A lot of these yeah. changing structures are really at this pixel level. Just play with the texture of the V1 list of field and V2 is a field. And, and uh, you know, somehow they learn it this way and, and they can just fool the system if they don't have the feedback to, to come back and say, for instance, when you come back and say, oh, it's a panda, then panda should have two eyes and, you know, black here and then something like that. And if you have this top down feedback, then you will not be you will not be fooled by it. And the reason these adversarial attacks so successful on, uh, on this uh, network is they don't have this top-down feedback. In a sense, when the generative model says, if you know it's a conditional probability, what should be my pixel on the image, given conditional on that it's a panda, then it will not be fooled. So in a sense, there's this top-down feedback when I say it's the computation of analysis by synthesis, is I'm trying to analyze the feed forward pixels by synthesizing what these pixels should be if it's a panda, yeah? And then you can compare, is it really a panda? Oh, God, it's not a panda, I won't be fooled. Oh, is it really giving us another fit? And this is in a sense that, you know, in, in that example I used, uh, a Mary neuron is firing, and I say, okay, Mary neuron, I know it's, two Gabor patches in the on-field on and off-field. Then I say, what could be, you know, you can predict. If it's firing, then I predict that it could be two white dots lined up horizontally, two black dots, lined up. it could be this, it could be that. And so if feedback with all these kind of likelihood functions, it's like a given Mary neurons firing, what is the likely input? It's a conditional probability. And then within that conditional probability distribution of likely input, you say, is it A or B or C or D? So imagine indeed you only have four choices. Then it's only two bits of information to uniquely nail down which one of these four choices is. And so that means in this way, the top-down feedback is querying from V1. Give me two, ad two additional bits of information, specifically only on this. So if the information bottleneck is 40 bits per second, then asking for two additional bits in the next second is not too much of a luxury. It's okay, it's still allowable. However, if you ask a general question, is this a beach, is this a mountain, you know, there's a, 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 you know, a million possibility, then it will be too many bits that it cannot, uh, and so in this sense that you feed forward giving heuristics of, of just a few possibilities that feedback to narrow it down with your internal model of what this Mary neuron is telling you about. Yeah. Very cool illusions, by the way. I really enjoyed those. That was Thank great. you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to kick you off, Thomas. Bye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, we have one. A final question here, and it was actually opposed by by Jim. Uh, and the question was, what is it like returning to run an experimental lab after all these years? Uh, and maybe I can just expand that a little bit and say, you know, can you can you maybe comment, you know, provide advice to people looking at at how to combine experiments, mm -hmm. you know, with um, you know, with more theory and and what your experience is 
you know, over the years yes. of, of making that uh, combination work? Yes, I, I thank you, Jim, for this question. I like to advocate that uh, modern day biology students should not uh, fear that they can learn a quantitative method. Um, they can be very good theorists because they know biology. Uh, and and uh, or another way, I have a slogan. My slogan is the best theorist is an experimentalist. The other way around is the best experimentalist is a theorist. And so I offend nobody, but I'm making everyone <laughs> feel that you are able to do that. A natural scientist, a natural science, we uh, make hypotheses, we observe nature, and then we extract regularities in nature and make them laws. And then we say, hmm, is this only a hypothesis? Go back to nature to test and falsify laws and, and, and get better ones. And we can make progress if we can uh, do this well. Doing this well requires collaborations with uh, people of different expertise. And I'm very lucky to have collaborated a lot with experimentalists. Um, and I actually uh, learned initial physiology from Jim Bowers, uh, Jim's uh, course. And I did my uh, uh, rat uh, electrophysiology physiology surgery learning in, in Jim Bowers' lab. And that really made me appreciate uh, doing experiments. And I learned a lot from my current colleagues like uh, uh, Uli, my collaborator, and he's such an expert on uh, uh, monkey electrophysiology, and he has great interest in primary visual cortex and top-down attention. I'm interested in bottom-up attention. I learned a lot from him. And so I appreciate a lot of these things. And uh, uh, there is a sense of fear in the beginning. I feel like, ah, oh, I'm a theorist. Am I good at uh, uh, doing an experiment? But, but the more I learn from experiment people, the more I can gain confidence. And I, I'm sure it's the same with the experimental uh, people. Once you start venturing into uh, computation, you will gain confidence. And that I think that's the future. Uh, and and uh, I like to encourage everybody to, to try that. Great. Mm -hmm. OK, I think uh, we are getting very close to the end of our Thank hour. You. And I think this is a good place um, to, to uh -huh. finish off with a sort of aspirational uh, note. Um, and mm -hmm. so if there are any additional questions, I think they can be posed on, on Neurostars. Um, but, but this is the end of our session now. This session will be, um, it is recorded, so it can still be watched again afterwards if, if you want to go back to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that, again, I, I'd like to, to thank um, our speaker. I think that was a great uh, session this morning. I, I think people really mm -hmm. enjoyed the, the illusions. Uh, and I, I think this mm -hmm. is a very helpful uh, question period um, uh, as well as, as a follow-up. So, so thank you again. Uh, and I know there is a party uh, that is to get started here uh, very shortly, so we should adjourn uh, and everyone enjoy the party. And thank you again uh, to Xiaoping. Thank you. Thank Good night, you. everyone. Mm -hmm.